we want to spend this time considering the issue of worship and the style of worship. Worship is a basic duty of humanity, a basic necessity, we may almost say, of the human life. We were made to worship God. And perhaps the best, the easiest way to see that is to look at the Psalms. For example, Psalm 29, Psalm 29 verses 1 and 2, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. What is worship? Worship is giving or ascribing to God the glory that is due unto him, the glory that is due unto his name. And then Psalm 95, Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. We worship God because He is our Maker. We give Him glory because He has made us. He is our Creator. And then Psalm 66. Psalm 66. And here the first four verses. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name, Selah. Here we see that all the earth ought to worship God. He is the creator of all the earth. We see that worship involves singing. And we'll come back to this later. And we see here that worship involves acknowledging the greatness of God's works. We saw that in verse 3 of Psalm 66. So we may say that worship is the proper response of the human creature to who God is and what he has done. But ever since the fall, our corrupt human nature has insisted on worshipping anything and everything else other than God himself. Romans chapter 1, which we have quoted a number of times already, but here verses 22 to 25 of Romans chapter 1. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever." Amen. So throughout history, from biblical times right up to the present day, man has insisted on worshipping all kinds of false gods. We have had all kinds of pagan practices and idolatry. Yet you might expect, even given that, you might expect that Christians at least would agree on worship, would find some true and standard way of worshipping. But today we find that the style of worship has become more diverse than ever. It's more and more an issue of confusion among Christians. There have been great sweeping attempts in recent years to modernize worship. You look at some of these megachurches and you find worship that is indistinguishable from a pop music concert. And this has become so popular that in some churches, they try to have the best of both worlds. They have a more traditional service, especially for the older generation. And then they have a more modern service to appeal to the young people. So how are we to come to terms with this diversity? How are we to explain and to try and evaluate these differences in the style of worship? Is there some right style of worship? Is there some way that we ought to worship? Are there other ways that we ought not to worship? 
Should we reject some of this diversity or should we embrace all of it? What can guide us in our thinking when we come to consider the style of worship? Again, we cannot cover everything here. And I keep emphasizing this because I don't want you to get the impression, I don't want to give you the impression that you can just listen to one message and then know everything. You have to look into all these things on your own. As I mentioned at the beginning, you have to be clear in your own mind. That is the biblical requirement for all of us as Christians. Search the scriptures on this, as on all the other issues. But this will be our general approach here. We will look firstly at the exercise of biblical worship, what it is and what it ought to be like. And then we will consider some biblical examples of worship, both good and bad. And then finally, we will try and take a look at some of the extravagances of modern so-called worship that we see around us. First of all, we consider the exercise of biblical worship. Now, worship, properly speaking, includes more than just singing. It includes the preaching of the word. It includes really everything in the worship service, the administration of the sacraments. All of that, properly speaking, is considered worship, is part of worship. But nowadays, worship, the word worship, has become synonymous with just singing, music, singing, that part of the worship service. That's all that is really considered when people popularly talk about worship. The danger in that is that it gives the impression that only at that part of the service do we as a congregation need to be active. It's only when we sing that we are actually actively worshipping God. In the rest of the service, we can just sit back. Our minds can wander a little bit. It's okay because that's not really worship. And that's dangerous. That's a false impression. All of it is part of worship. We are to be actively worshipping throughout the service. When we hear God's word, we are to hear it actively, prayerfully. We are to understand it. We are to meditate on it even there in the worship service. We are to follow along with what is being said, follow along with scripture and the exposition of scripture. We are to be active in all these things. We are to be praising and glorifying God for his word, for his works that are revealed in his word. We must be active throughout the whole worship service. With the sacraments also, actively participate. We don't just passively sit back and let others do everything and we let our minds wander. We can doze off a bit. No, not at all. But we will end up focusing here quite a bit on music, just because that is such an area of controversy and confusion today. But again, have this right view in mind that all of this, the preaching of the word, the sacraments and the music, all of it is part of worship. And don't let yourself become too focused on only the music as worship. But now again, as I said, we are looking at the exercise of worship. We want to consider firstly, what is the essence of worship? And then we want to look at music as an expression of worship. So now the essence of worship. And here we want to ask ourselves the question and answer it biblically. What should the worship of God be like? What ought it to be like? And I think the best text for us to look at to find an answer to this is John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and for the context here, let me read from verse 19 all the way to verse 24. John chapter 4, verse 19. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him 
in spirit and in truth. Now, I'm sure you know the context here. We have the Samaritan woman whom Jesus met at the well. And she's asking here in the verses that we read, basically a similar question to the one that we just asked. How should God be worshipped? And really, she's trying to change the subject because just before the verses that we read, Jesus had pointed to her sin. She said, five husbands, and the man she's now living with is not her husband. She's really trying to change the subject. She's trying to steer the conversation into a theological debate. She, as a Samaritan, had her own place of worship. The Samaritans had their own place of worship, the mountain that she refers to. That's where they worshipped God. And they had their own books, their own scripture. They had their own way of worship. And so she asks, you Jews say that everyone should worship in Jerusalem, that we have our place of worship. So which one is correct? She asks the question. She raises the issue. And Jesus answers by explaining what worship really ought to be. You notice that he begins by defining worship in terms of who God is. Worship depends on the nature of God. The nature of worship, the essence of worship, depends on the nature and the essence of God. Verse 24, God is a spirit. Because God is the proper and sole object of worship, He is the one who defines worship. We don't get to decide what worship is like based on our own preferences and our own opinions. It is based on who God is. God is a spirit. And therefore, those who worship him must, Jesus uses the word, must worship him in this way. There is a particular way of worship because we are worshipping a particular and specific God, the one living and true God, who is a spirit. And based on this nature of God, Jesus gives two principles, two things that worship must be. First, it must be in spirit. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit. Now, to understand this, we have to keep in mind the context here. The woman has been asking about the place of worship. And Jesus has said in verse 21, the hour is coming when People will worship not at your mountain and not even in Jerusalem. The place is not really the most important thing because God is a spirit. He's not confined to any one place. We don't have this pagan perception of God as tied to a particular locality. He is a spirit. He's not confined in that way. So what matters in worshipping God is not merely the external trapping of place, or ritual, but because he is a spirit, he must be worshipped in spirit. The worship of God is not merely an outward performance. The worship of God must come from the heart. It must involve the full engagement of the whole being, all the faculties of the soul and the mind. All of it must be involved in worship. When we worship God, we are fully engaged in the entirety of our being, in the exercise of worshipping God. That is the essence of true worship. It must be in spirit. It's not merely an outward performance, but it is heart and soul and mind fully engaged in that act of worship. Those who worship God, if they would worship Him truly, must worship Him in spirit. And then secondly, worship must be in truth. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And again, in order to understand this, we have to keep in mind the context, because the woman has drawn a contrast between the Samaritans and the Jews. And Jesus has pointed to that difference in terms of knowledge. Verse 21, he talked about the place not being important. Verse 22, he talked about the knowledge being important. You worship, you know not what. You don't know what you are worshipping. You don't know God. You don't know the truth about God. Because again, as I said, the Samaritans had their own scripture. They did not recognize truly the revelation of God in His Word. 
That revelation had been given and entrusted to the Jews. The Jews know God, Jesus says. He's not speaking about the Pharisees and those who twist and pervert and misinterpret the scripture. He's talking about the Jews in general as a nation, as God's chosen people to whom he had given and entrusted his word. The Jews, seen in this light, Jesus says, know God because they have, they receive his word, his truth. Salvation is of the Jews. They have the word of salvation. They have the word of God. And so those who worship God must worship in truth, according to the truth that God has revealed. In other words, worship must be informed by Scripture. Biblical guidelines, biblical principles apply when we come to consider how we ought to worship and all the details that we have to work out to do with worship. Everything must be done in the light of Scripture, biblical principles and biblical guidelines. God has told us in His Word how He wants to be worshipped. He has not left it entirely up to us. So again, we are not at liberty to merely invent from the ground up our own way, our own method, our own style of worship and expect God simply to accept it and be pleased with it. We must worship Him in spirit and in truth. We worship God as we love Him, with heart and soul and mind, according to His Word. That is the essence of worship, spirit and truth. So how does this understanding of worship, in its essence, apply to the expression of worship? that is, using music. And again, don't get the impression that worship is just music, as I mentioned earlier. But again, since this is an important area of controversy, we have to deal with it, we have to be clear about it. And we have to begin by recognizing that music is a gift of God. It is a wonderful gift. There's something very special about music. I'm sure you know this, I'm sure you've experienced it in your own life. We use music in this way because it has the power to move and to influence us on a very deep level. There's something special and mysterious about the effect that music can have on us. Music can uplift and cheer. Music can depress and sadden. Music can excite and inflame. Music can frighten and terrify. Music can have all this kind of effect on us. We may say, in, indeed, that music speaks to the soul. We may describe music as a language of the soul. But you see, this is precisely why we use music in our worship of God. It is because our worship of God must be in spirit that we use music. It is because worship must involve the full engagement of the human soul. And music is that vehicle that allows the deep motions and movements of the soul to find expression. That's why we use music in our worship. And because the worship of God must be not only in spirit but also in truth, therefore we don't just use any kind of music. We sing psalms and hymns with lyrics that have doctrinal content and richness and music that matches and supports those words. We don't use music that has its own language or has its own meaning or has its own expression that it's trying to convey that is antithetical to the words. We find music, a tune that matches what the words are conveying so that there is a harmony between them. And then we can worship God with our mind and also with our heart. We worship God fully through music. It is a vehicle that allows us to do that. And that's why we use music in our worship, because it helps us to worship God in spirit and in truth. And so we have these twin passages in the New Testament. If you look at Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians 5 and verse 19. Ephesians 5 verse 19 speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, 
singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And here this verse is emphasizing more of the spirit side of things, making melody in your heart to the Lord, an expression of the soul, an expression, expression of the individual soul, singing and praising God and glorifying Him and worshipping Him. But even here we have a recognition of the truth side of things. It is not just any music, but psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, not carnal melodies, but spiritual melodies, not sensual and fleshly, but godly and edifying to the soul. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, spiritual, doctrinal and true. So here we have again both spirit and truth, but a little bit more emphasis on the spirit side of things. In the other verse in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, here we find a bit more emphasis on the truth side of things. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Here, music as an expression of the soul can teach can admonish because of that doctrinal content, because it is grounded in truth, in God's word. It is an expression of the soul that comes forth from the word of Christ that dwells in you richly in all wisdom. So music as an expression both of spirit and truth, an expression of the whole being, heart and soul and mind, worshipping God according to his word in spirit and and in truth. Both of these are important and it is this dual emphasis, I think, that explains why we can so easily go wrong with our use of music, explains why this is such a controversy today. Because music is powerful and we need both these aspects, both spirit and truth, if we are to use music rightly in our worship of God to understand it and direct it and control it so that it enhances our worship and doesn't detract from it. We can go wrong if we focus too much on the truth side of things. We can become proud and self-righteous. We can pat ourselves on the back and say, look at us, we sing only hymns or we sing only psalms. We are not like those outlandish people. We're not like those in the modern charismatic movement. Look at them with all their fancy guitars and drums and all their flashing strobe lights and everything. We're not like that. We only sing hymns. But then our worship is cold and formal and heartless. Yes, we may sing lyrics that are full of doctrinal truth, but we don't mean them. We don't sing from our hearts. There is no emotion, no joy, no genuine praise. And that's false worship. We've overemphasized truth and we have forgotten the spirit. It's not that truth is wrong, but if we emphasize only truth and there's no spirit, no heart, no genuine conviction in any of the things that we say, then that's not true worship. We have gone wrong. We have gone astray. We have used music wrongly in our worship. But we can go wrong the other way also. Not all emotion is good. The heart is capable not just of spiritual feeling, but the heart is very capable of carnal, sensual, fleshly, sinful feeling. And the music that we use, if it is not carefully chosen, can stir up that carnality. If our worship is not directed and conditioned by the principles of Scripture, then we end up overemphasizing the spirit side of things. Whatever music stir, stirs us up the most, it doesn't matter whether the passions that it stirs are godly or carnal. As long as it stirs up some feeling, some great amount of feeling, we cling to it and say, I want this kind of music because then it makes the worship service lively. Everyone is on their feet clapping and dancing and singing. That's worship. But if it's not according to truth, if it's just spirit, if it's just emotion, but all carnal and sensual and not spiritual, not godly, then that's also not true worship. It's false worship. We have gone too far the other way. Again, we have used music wrongly in our worship. 
because we have not used it according to the truth. A whole lot of spirit, but no truth. So both of these extremes, both of these wrong directions, both of these wrong ways to use worship, and both of these come down to the fact that in our worship, in our use of music, we're not really thinking about God. If we overemphasize the truth side, as I mentioned earlier, we're not thinking about God. We're just thinking about ourselves and how good and how pure and how holy and how righteous we are. If we overemphasize the spirit side also, we're not thinking about God. We're thinking about ourselves and how excited and how passionate we are. When we forget God, when God is not the center of our worship, when our worship is not designed and directed towards God and what He wants and what pleases Him, then we go wrong. We can go wrong in both these ways. There is danger. We need both spirit and truth directed towards God as the sole and proper object of worship. That is the exercise of biblical worship. And that brings us now to consider some examples of biblical worship. And this will serve to reinforce some of the points that we have already made. First of all, look at the example of Cain and Abel, all the way back in Genesis chapter 4. I'm sure you know this account of Cain and Abel, how they both brought offerings to God. Abel's offering was accepted, while Cain's was rejected. Genesis chapter 4, verse 3. In process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? So we have these two offerings. And why was one accepted and the other rejected? The book of Hebrews tells us that Cain did not offer by faith. His offering, his worship was not founded on a trust and acceptance of God's word. Cain knew what God wanted. That's why God challenged him. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? You know what you ought to do. And if you do what you're supposed to do, if you do well, you will be accepted. The reason why your offering was not accepted is because you did not do what I wanted you to do in my worship. You did as you pleased and not as I pleased. And you should know that. Cain knew what God wanted. But Cain's attitude was, if it's good enough for me, if it pleases me, if it's acceptable to me, then God must accept it. It must be good enough for him. I worship God as I please. And whatever I bring, whatever I offer, God is obliged to accept. That was Cain's attitude. Worship is about me, in other words, and what I want. It's not about God. It's not about what God wants. And this difference in attitude really is brought out in the details of the text right here that we've just read. Compare Abel's offering in verse 4. Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. There was careful thought that went into his offering. Because he knew what pleased, what pleased God, he took care to choose out of his flock what he knew would be pleasing to God. The firstlings, perhaps a recognition or as a recognition that all the increase of his flock came from God. So he chose of the firstlings of his flock, a kind of first fruits. And he offered of the fat, because he knew that the fat was the choicest part of the offering. And indeed, later on in the Mosaic Law, we find God telling Israel that all the fat of the offerings belongs to him. It's the best part. Abel knew that. He knew that it would please God. He knew that it was what God wanted. And so he took care to give God, in his worship of God, what would please God, not what would please Abel. Compare that to how Cain's offering is described. Verse 3, it's just a bare statement. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. It was a careless offering. No thought went into this. He didn't care about what God wanted or how God had revealed that he was to be worshipped. 
It was all about Cain, not about God. So this example is significant for us. It reinforces again the point that worship is about God and what He wants, not about us and what pleases us. And then another example, the example of David. And this is an important passage for us to deal with because it is very often used today to justify the modern over-exuberant style of worship. 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 14. 2 Samuel 6 verse 14. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. And this is what they say. They say, look, David danced before the Lord with all his might. I remember once hearing a pastor, and in his preaching he was telling a story about something that happened to him. And as I recall, he said he was at some kind of seminar or some kind of Christian talk, and he was attending and he was standing at the back of this auditorium, and someone was at the front speaking. And this pastor was standing at the back, and suddenly God spoke to him. And God said, I want you to dance. So this pastor was surprised. Why do you want me to dance, God? You want me to dance here at the back of the auditorium? I'll make a fool of myself. What if these people turn around and see me dancing all by myself? And then, according to him, God spoke to him and said, Remember that David danced before me. So now I want you to dance. And so he did. So there was this pastor dancing away all by himself at the back of this auditorium because David danced before the Lord. So therefore, it's okay for me to dance with all my might. That's the kind of thing that they say. Because David danced, we dance today in our worship. But is that really the case? Is that a good application of this text? What actually is going on here? We have to look at this more closely, and really, we ought to look at the parallel passage, because there is a lot more detail there. In 1 Chronicles 15, 1 Chronicles 15, from verse 11, and let me point out a few things here about this parallel passage, talking about the same event when David was bringing the ark back to Jerusalem. Here, 1 Chronicles 15, verse 11. David called for the priests and the Levites, verse 12, and said unto them, Ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel in, unto the place that I have prepared for it. For because ye did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after the due order. David is talking about what happened not long before, the first attempt he made to bring the ark back to Jerusalem failed miserably because he put the ark on a cart and as it was being transported, it shifted. And one of the men put out his hand to steady the ark and God struck him dead because he touched the ark. And here David says the reason why that first attempt failed is because we didn't do it right. We didn't do it God's way. We just did it whatever seemed expedient or convenient for us. We put the ark on a cart because it was easier to transport it that way. But that was wrong. There was a prescribed way of doing things. And because we did not seek God after the due order, therefore God made a breach upon us. Therefore that first attempt failed. Now we are going to do it right. We are going to do it according to the order that God has prescribed. So already here there is talk of order. There is talk of what God wants. There is talk of God's way of doing things. And then as you read on in 1 Chronicles 15, you find a great deal of order to this whole procession. Verse 16 and 17, you find that particular people were appointed to be singers and with certain instruments. This is to be a joyful procession. They're bringing the ark back triumphantly to Jerusalem. And so the singers and instruments are all chosen in advance. And then verse 20, you have mention of Alamoth. And then verse 21, with harps on the Sheminith to excel. And these words, Alamoth, Sheminith, they may be a reference to musical terms. They may be a reference to tunes or melodies. 
All of these things were prescribed. Particular styles of music were chosen, appropriate to the situation. It wasn't just haphazard. It wasn't just as they pleased, whatever they felt like in the moment. Yes, there was a great deal of heart and spirit and joy and exuberance, but it wasn't disordered. It wasn't chaos. David, very significantly, was concerned with music, and he instituted and organized the singers for the temple choir, the temple which was soon to be built. And again, as we have seen, this use of music in worship is entirely legitimate when it is properly controlled when it is properly ordered. And notice finally that this event, as it is described here, is an open-air civic procession. They are bringing the ark back to Jerusalem as a civic parade. All Israel is involved. You read that in the text. They bring the ark through the streets. It's a victory parade, a triumphant march like that you would find when an army returns victorious from battle. They march through the streets and there is great joy and rejoicing because of their triumph, their victory. That's what is going on here. And significantly, importantly, when it comes to the temple which was soon to be built and the worship that took place at the temple itself, there is no mention of dancing. There is singing, yes, but it is all ordered and prescribed and appointed. No dancing. So really, there is no warrant here for the modern ex excess in worship. There's no justification for the disorderly shaking and falling and pandemonium that we find in some so-called Christian congregations in their style of worship. No one can legitimately say, David danced before the Lord, so we dance in our worship services in church. That's not a correct use of this passage of Scripture. So this example does not apply as prescriptive for our worship today in terms of the dancing of David. And then the final example that we want to consider is the encounter of Elijah with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. I think this is a very relevant passage for us because it gives us a very ready contrast between two styles of worship the godly, spiritual style of worship, and the pagan, carnal style of worship. 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. From verse 20, really, all the way to the end. But again, I'll just pick out a few points for us to consider. Again, I'm sure you know the account. The challenge is issued by Elijah. Verse 23, two bullocks one for the prophets of Baal and one for Elijah. And they will put no fire under it. And then verse 24, they will call on the name of their respective God. The prophets of Baal will call on their God, their false God. Elijah will call on the true God. And whichever one answers with fire, that will be seen, that will be proven to be the true God. And this is worship. They're offering a sacrifice. They're offering worship. To God, Elijah to the one living and true God, the prophets of Baal to Baal, the false God. This is worship. But look at the different styles of worship. See the prophets of Baal, how they, how they worship. Verse 26, they took the bullock which was given them and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even unto evening, saying, O Baal, hear us. And there doesn't seem to be anything much in terms of doctrinal content in their worship. They just cry and call out to God, their God, Baal. They don't say much, just, O Baal, hear us. Perhaps they repeat the same thing again and again. Perhaps they chant intelligibly or unintelligibly. In verse 26, at the end, they leaped upon the altar which was made. They were jumping up and down. In verse 28, they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner. This is what they usually did in their worship of their false god. They were crying and shouting and leaping and cutting themselves. A whole lot of spirit, a whole lot of enthusiasm. You may even call it frenzy, but not according to the truth. This is their pagan style of worship. Very extravagant, 
but not true, false. And then look at how Elijah worships. Look at verse 36, how he calls on God. He's speaking to God. He's talking to a real person. It's not just monotonous repetition. It's not mindless chanting. He's speaking to a real person. He is relating to God in a real sense. And there's a great doctrinal content to what he's saying. He acknowledges the truth that God has revealed about himself. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel. God has revealed himself in that way. And he acknowledges that revelation in his worship, in his calling on God. It is worship according to the truth. But is there no spirit in it? No, there's plenty of spirit. Just look at how Elijah speaks to God, how he pleads with God. Verse 37, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. And you only have to look at the context here before and after, verse or in chapter 19, to see how Elijah was truly burdened for Israel, that they would turn back to God. Elijah had a real relationship with God. He loved God. He was full of passion and spirit for God, for God's truth. So here we have worship in spirit and in truth, contrasted with false, carnal, pagan worship, a very ready contrast that we can readily observe. And that brings us finally to consider some of what we see in these modern styles of worship. We've already seen that true worship must be in spirit and in truth. Both are necessary. We have seen that the use of music in worship, <coughs> excuse me, we've seen that the use of music in worship must be regulated according to both of these, according to spirit and according to truth. We've seen that early on, there was a sinful tendency in man to make himself the center and focus on worship of worship instead of God. And we've seen, finally, just this last example that we looked at, this very stark contrast between godly and ungodly worship. And now on this final point, the extravagances of modern worship. Although, again, there are, there are many things that could be said, we will confine ourselves to just very briefly two features of modern Christianity as representative of some of these modern styles of worship. First of all, we will look at the, the church growth movement. And then secondly, we will look at contemporary Christian music. Firstly, the church growth movement, which is also known as the seeker-sensitive movement. It started sometime around the 1980s or a little bit before that, perhaps. And the aim is very simple, as the name suggests. It is to grow the church. Their focus is on numbers, whatever methods work best to bring in the numbers. And some of them like to call it consecrated pragmatism, whatever works to increase the numbers of the congregation. And this movement claims not to water down the gospel message. That claim is not really accurate. But the focus for us, the point comes as we examine the style of worship that these churches employ. Because the focus is on being friendly and accessible and appealing to the masses, to non-Christians. They're going for numbers. So in their worship, instead of a detailed exposition of Scripture, they instead have stories and jokes. The focus is not on what you should be or what you should do for God, but the focus of their message is what God can be, what God can do for you because they want it to be appealing, they want it to be attractive. This is what you get if you become a Christian. This is what you will gain if you become a Christian. This is the profit. This is the advantage. This is what God can do for you. That's already making man the center of worship, making man the center of the message and not God. Worship becomes more about entertainment because they're trying to attract unbelievers. And they say, after all, if we talk like Christians, if we preach like Christians, if we worship like Christians, then non-Christians won't want to join us. And we want non-Christians to join us, so therefore we must be less Christian 
in our preaching, in our worship. We must be more like the world in our worship. Then the world will come in. That's their thinking. But again, what should determine our style of worship? It's not even what Christians want that should determine our style of worship, let alone what non-Christians want. But as we have already seen, what determines our style of worship is what God wants, what He has told us that He wants. Our worship is for God, to glorify and praise Him. It's not for, our, not for ourselves to satisfy and tickle our fancies. And it's not for unbelievers to impress and persuade them. Our worship is for God. That, that, that is its focus. That is its purpose. That is the center of worship. And on top of that, what does Scripture say will actually persuade unbelievers? Look at 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned. He is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. That is significant for us. Actually, if there is disorder, mayhem, confusion in the church, if there is no truth, no scripture in the preaching, in the message, then the unbelievers will not be convicted. They will not be convinced of anything. If there is nothing but worldly entertainment in the church service, no one will ever be persuaded to come to Christ. Because Christ is not there in the service, not mentioned, not set forth as He truly is. The unbeliever comes in and sees nothing but what he's already used to seeing in the world. There's nothing there to draw him away from the world. Nothing there to truly draw him to Christ. But if all prophesy, as Paul says, Paul says, that's a reference to the Word of God, to the preaching of the Word. If all prophesy, if all give the Word of God, then the unbeliever is convicted by the power of God's Word and God's Spirit. Because the Word of God is powerful. And these seeker-sensitive types forget that. The Word of God is powerful, quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. You don't need to twist it, you don't need to veil it, you don't need to cover it, you don't need to sugar it, you don't need to dress it up. It is already as it is, as God gave it, quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, bone and marrow. The unbeliever is convicted because the Word of God, used by the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, pierces his soul and reveals him to be a sinner before God a holy and righteous judge. And he falls down on his face and worships God because he sees God there in the worship, because the worship of the, of the church is directed towards God. If the worship of the church is directed towards the unbeliever, then the unbeliever will sit there seeing himself and worshipping himself. No one is helped by that. So there is a fundamental fallacy to this seeker-sensitive idea of worship that you must see. Spiritual, biblical worship, which is focused on God, will lead people to God. And then we want to consider, finally, contemporary Christian music, or CCM. And there is a link here, because I think a big reason why CCM has become so popular and so adopted by so many churches is precisely because it is popular in the world, especially with young people. And the churches think if they don't start bringing in this CCM, then they will lose the young people. The young people will leave the church and they don't want that. So again, pragmatism. They're trying to keep people in the church. And so they bring in what is popular in the world, bring it into the church so that people will stay in the church. We've already seen that there's a fallacy, a problem, a danger with this kind of man-centered approach. But even looking at CCM it itself, in terms of the music and so on, already we find a problem. Now once again, this is a big topic, 
We can't go into the details here. We can't talk about music theory and all those kinds of things. We only have time to treat this very briefly. But we know enough already from what has already been said to make two very important points. The first point concerning music. We've already seen how powerful music can be in affecting and influencing us. Music has associations. It can be either carnal or spiritual. There is such a thing as carnal music, and there is such a thing as spiritual music. The choice of music, therefore, is extremely important. It's not irrelevant. Not all music is appropriate for the worship of God. It's one thing to evaluate the lyrics of a song. You also have to consider the music, whether it is appropriate to the lyrics, whether it is appropriate to the worship of God. So not all music is appropriate. And the second important point we have to make concerns contemporary music. Contemporary music is not spiritual. It is worldly and carnal because it is of the world and the world is not godly. The world is opposed to God. That, that is a basic fact that we find in Scripture. That we see with our eyes if we will open them and look on the world. The world is not godly. Therefore, the world's kind of music will not be godly music. The world is not spiritual. The world is carnal. We were once like that. Therefore, the world's kind of music will not be spiritual. It will be carnal in the very nature of the case. So whatever music is popular with the world is not going to be suitable for worship. We can state that as a general principle right off the bat. So taking the music that is popular in the world and bringing it into the church we can already see is a bad idea, even without going into the details of music theory and so on. We already should be on our guard against bringing what is popular with the world into the church, into the worship. Now again, when I talk about contemporary music, I'm not saying that every Christian hymn written in recent years ought to be rejected. Again, we have to go into details. We have to look at each case. We have to consider these things systematically, honestly, frankly. But again, as a general principle, we consider the music, we consider the lyrics, we don't just look at the popularity with the world of the song or the singer and think, oh, that's popular. If I bring it into church, then my church will be popular too. We don't think that way. The focus is on God. Whatever we do, we must have decided biblically, prayerfully, that this is really appropriate for the worship of the one living and true God. That must be our focus. And so as we come to conclusion, worship is our most fundamental duty. It is our highest calling. It is our greatest privilege. When we get it wrong, it is our greatest failure. It's not something to trifle with. Remember Romans chapter 1, verse 25, the sin for which man is condemned. They changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. How much that applies to so-called modern worship that puts man at the center. Man, the creature, becomes the focus and the object of worship effectively and not God. Even though they use the name of God, they are not truly worshipping Him. In so many cases, tragically, they are worshipping themselves. And that is a great failure. When our worship becomes man-centered and you and I can fall into that trap, don't forget that. Don't think we are immune just because we are in a traditional church or happen to be in a church that rejects contemporary Christian music or other things. You and I can be man-centered in our worship. Whatever else is going on around us, if we are focused on ourselves, glorifying ourselves in our hearts, full of pride and self-righteousness, devoid of thought of God, devoid of humility and meekness before Him. If we do not truly prostrate ourselves before Him and glorify Him for His mercy towards unworthy sinners like ourselves, we can become man-centered in our worship too. And the moment we do that, we have failed. We are not truly worshipping God. We are in great danger. We need to repent. But when we get it right, when we get worship right, 
then it is our greatest joy. Just read the Psalms. See what joy there is in the true worship of God. You don't need the music of the world. You don't need all these artificial means to hype yourself up. Just think of God as He truly is. Understand Him in His Word. You cannot help but overflow with genuine, godly exuberance and enthusiasm. Think of God, who He is and what He has done. And once you rightly grasp that truth, Worship, as it were, comes bubbling out of you. Naturally and truly, it is worship in spirit and in truth because it is focused on God. And God is so great. God is so good. God is so wonderful and amazing. You cannot help but worship Him. And that worship comes from the core of your very being. It fully engages you because He is God, infinite. You give your whole self to the worship of God. The true worship of God is the Christians, the Church's greatest joy. It is a joyful thing to celebrate and praise God for who He is and what He has done. So worship God in spirit and in truth, in public and in private. It will be our joy in this life and through all eternity. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you and you alone are worthy of worship. You are our creator. You are infinite, eternal and unchangeable. You are full of goodness and mercy and grace. You are a just and a holy God, awesome and mighty in your works and your deeds. And we have seen so much of your great work in our own hearts, in our own lives. You have saved us when we were lost, when we were hopelessly ensnared in the grip of sin. You saved us. You brought us into your kingdom. Now you promise us eternal joy and bliss in your presence. How can we not worship you? How can, you, how can we not worship you in spirit and in truth? I pray that you would help us in all our thinking about the style of worship not just to be intellectual, but to really feel in our hearts, to worship you with our minds, but with our hearts, with our souls as well, that our whole being may be devoted to you. This will be indeed our joy for eternity, and how we thank thee that you have given us a little taste of it here on earth. Help us not to miss that glorious taste of eternity that we find everywhere, you are worshipped in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.